Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Education meeting for Tuesday, August 31st. Um, can we begin with the pledge, please? Jan, would you like to lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, move on to, uh, we've got the superintendent's report. Matt, would you like to? Yep, absolutely. So thanks, Ed. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, nice to see everyone here. Did, did you want to excuse? Oh, you know what? Um, I apologize. I'll take a moment and I will excuse Diane and Jody from the meeting this evening. We have them out on special assignment. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks to everybody. Welcome and anybody that's tuning in. Thanks for tuning in tonight. So uh, very excited. We've got the start of the school year, uh, really at this point a week away. Uh, uh, had a nice little uh, sort of welcoming scavenger hunt ceremony over here at Winchester Potters and the kids. A lot of great turnout. Kids very excited. Uh, teachers very excited. Nice to see everybody back here tonight. So um, I thought I would just take a, little, a few moments just to talk a little bit about there's been some guidance updates as I feel like every time I come into a board meeting we're talking about guidance updates. But there have been some guidance updates. Um, so I just wanted to sort of just throw a few things out there. And I know we uh, probably have some visitors tonight that may want to uh, uh, ask some questions. And we typically don't engage in a lot of dialogue. But I thought I might address a couple of areas that might be somewhat responsive to that. And clearly, if anybody asks any questions that we, we can't answer tonight, we'll make sure we get answers for them on uh, a timely manner. So a um, couple of the big things just to focus on. One of the things is the masks. And I know we've had some questions about mask mandates. And you know, is it required? Is it strongly encouraged for people to wear masks? So. It started off with the county health department indicating that uh, there was going to be a, a mask requirement for anybody over the age of two uh, while in our school facilities. Outside, basically, they're saying it's strongly encouraged, but it's not required outside. So uh, we had sent out uh, a kind of a summary of the guidance document uh, last week, actually, and then again this week as well, just to give some people some information. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of similarities and common, common, uh, commonalities among how school districts are functioning throughout Erie County. Uh, we try to stay on the same page to some degree and have been working with the health department on this. Uh, the, health, the state health department has also issued a mask mandate as well. So we've got two health authorities that are issuing mandates on that. Uh, while I don't have the exact, I know there was, might be some questions about the exact, you know, quote the law and everything. Not yet. Um, you'll have an opportunity, don't worry, I promise. Um, that's something that we can go ahead and try to get some, get some information specifically which law it is that's telling us uh, that we have to listen to what the county or the state has to say. So. Uh, the other question that we were getting as well, too, was about our remote academy. So we had sent out a survey to our, our kind of a communication to our families uh, a little while back. Uh, basically, the state has not required school districts to create a remote learning opportunity similar to what was in place uh, from school districts last year. Uh, they did, however, give us a little bit of leeway, essentially, to go ahead and put one in place and say, hey, if there's a way you can work with families, uh, please feel free to do that. So one of the things that we did, and again, I think you're going to see a lot of commonality throughout the area. Uh, as we said, that if a student had a documented uh, situation where they had the compromised immune system that uh, their doctor felt it was so significant that they couldn't be on campus, uh, that we would go ahead and we would provide a remote option for that student. So uh, I will just you know, put out there that you know, we had some parents respond, and we've been working with those parents to be able to provide that. We're partnering with Erie One BOCES uh, to be able to provide that programming. Um, we do have, this has always been in the education law, there's an, op, there's an ability if a student has a uh, diagnosed medical condition and has a doctor's note, uh, that there's another form of, uh, another way to access their education. Uh, it's called home hospital instruction, and that is something that is available uh, with a doctor's, in, with con in consultation with a doctor. Uh, it, it's not something that puts you out for the entire year necessarily. You kind of go in typically like two month chunks, but you work, we work with a doctor depending on what the situation is. Uh, if it's anxiety, if it's a, that's a medical injury or something like that that prohibits a student from coming into school, uh, they're entitled to an education as well. It's not, it doesn't look the same as a remote academy. Um, that you're not going to find anywhere in the education law. What you will find, though, is the home hospital instruction. So um, just so that people understand, that is, you know, one way or another, we're going to find ways to educate kids if they can't be here on campus. So um, I just those two points in particular, I know I've gotten a few questions from um, some folks on that as well. Um, if I'll just take another moment or two, just some of the priorities that seem to come, that stem from what the county health department uh, wanted to be able to put in place. When they talk about social distancing, um, you know, if you notice there's not a firm, you have to be 
three feet apart at all times. They said, you should do your best. You, we should have kids three feet apart, but not to the extent that excludes kids from school. So I know that was a big question, you know, kind of early on, like, hey, what does this mean? Is three feet mean three feet? And what they're saying is do your very level best. And in the vast majority of situations within our classrooms, we can have kids three feet apart. We have that ability to be able to do that. Lunches were another big question. We were asking questions like lunches. Tell us what, what the guidance is. What, what is it you're requiring? And they basically said the same thing. For lunches, as far as that's concerned, we're to try to get kids to be that three feet distance apart to the extent possible, but it should not keep a kid from coming into school is what they said. Uh, I think what the county sensed was that their, you know, schools have limitations. We, we're only so big, uh, you know, as far as our physical footprint is concerned. So um, I think their, their approach is it's the risk reduction model is what they're kind of taking. So they basically say, it's kind of like back in March of 2020 where they said, you can go to Target if you need to, but just make sure it's worth it. You know, it's that it's important enough to be able to go to Target. Uh, most people would argue Target's pretty important, but, um, you know, if you're going to go, just make sure you mask up, make sure you wash your hands, all those good things. Um, but don't just go out and take arbitrary trips to the store. So I think what the, the, the approach the county is taking here is, you know, without at the risk of speaking for them too much, is we realize you have to eat if you're going to be in lunch. So, and we realize you can't quite get, you know, that six or three feet of distance in all cases. So we're going to say, here's one area where, all right, have the kids eat their food, get the masks back on afterwards. So... Uh, that was a big area of question. Even in phys ed class, they said the phys ed class is no different than any other class at this point. They want the kids to be three, far, three feet apart to the maximum degree possible. Uh, we are going to work to try to get kids uh, out as much as possible, outside as much as possible, especially with the nice weather here. Um, the one area that they did uh, issue some pretty hard line restrictions at this point would be music. Uh, and I was just actually having a conversation with a parent just before the meeting here. Um, they, they've even uh, adjusted that since that time. So at this point, as far as music is concerned, you're supposed to be six feet apart if you are singing, with the exception, if you're wearing a mask, you can be three feet apart. Okay, so that's something that we're going to be able to do, which is helpful for us. Um, if you're playing a wind instrument, though, you still need to be six feet apart during practices and rehearsals and things like that. But they did say that for performances, there would be an added layer of flexibility, which is, I think, encouraging as well, because I know this is a big music town. People appreciate their concerts and performances. The only restriction they put in there is, is that if you're not performing, you need to put your mask back on. And if you are, uh, if the, the audience needs to be at least six feet from the performance group, so as a collective whole there. So basically, that's not going to be an issue for us because our stages and our, where we have the, our audience is definitely at least six feet apart. So that's not going to be an issue. Um, the school bus was another big area of question as well. And in the school bus, they basically said that, you know, you can, everybody needs to wear a mask on the school bus. Uh, they, they want families to sit together. And the other thing they said too, and that you're going to see a lot of this is seating charts. So they want seating charts in the event that has some sort of contact tracing has to happen. Um, that basically what they're telling you is that, you know, they just want to be able to know who to contact so they can minimize the number of people that have to be quarantined. So... Uh, but other than that, school buses, we're going to be running in a pretty typical manner. So uh, if you're a parent that, we've routed everyone. So if you're a parent that is going to be driving your kid to school, that's fine. If you haven't, let's say it's October and you haven't once driven your kid to school, you know, might not, be, might not be a bad idea to pick up the phone and just let the transportation department know that, hey, I know my child hasn't been on the bus the past few weeks, but they're going to be coming now just so the driver knows to look for them. Uh, but we've routed for everyone. So I know you've probably read in the paper that a number of districts are really up against it as far as transportation staff is concerned. Um, we could certainly use a few more bus drivers at this point, so if anybody knows anyone, cheap, uh, shameless plug, but, um, but we're going to be okay uh, at this point. So, Another question that came up too, and I just wanted to, to address this as well, people were asking, what kind of involvement can families have in our community event, our events in schools and things like that? We really do want to have families. We, we value moms and dads and aunts and uncles coming in. Um, if you notice in the document we threw out the other day, uh, we did say, you know, we're encouraging people to try to limit to one family member per child for these events. But if you notice, we're not saying it's an absolute mandate. Again, I hate to get back and forth in this strongly encouraged versus required, but we're trying to be flexible here. We know how important it is to have families on campus for different events and things like that. So, uh, and you know, how we start the year right now could be very different in a month from now. And I hope for the better, to be quite honest with you. So we want to see parents coming in. We want to see people coming in, whether it's a, you know, an open house or a concert uh, you know, a, a Halloween festival, whatever it is, we want to see people coming in for those things. They might look a little different. We might stagger things. We might have something outside that was typically held indoors. Um, but, you know, I, I think the, the, the message, the question that we just keep asking ourselves, when someone says, can we do this? We say, is it important? 
And if the answer is yes, then all right, well, let's start the problem solving process now. How do we get at that? You know, if it's the Halloween festival that everybody loves, all right, well, it brings a lot of people. There's 350 people that show up for this thing. Maybe that's too many. Okay, can we hold part of it outside or can we stagger it or something along those lines? Um, so that's the sort of, I, I, we're going to honestly try to get ourselves, keep ourselves in that mindset. Um, so the other thing I guess I just want to point out too, is separate from all of this, okay, because I mean, you know, it's interesting. We're talking a lot about what we can't do, what our limitations and restrictions are. But to be honest with you, the fact that we can be here together, the fact that we can have our students in session every day, I mean, that's amazing. And there are so many other things that we need to be focusing on, whether it be our students' social and emotional well-being, whether it be our, their academic achievement, whether it be ways to keep them engaged through creating different kinds of clubs and activities and things like that. I, you know, honestly, like, that's, that's where I think our eye needs to be. We, we've onboarded a number of staff, a number of teachers in particular over the past few weeks. I've had a chance. I sit with every one of them as they come through uh, for the, kind of their final interview. And, you know, I've had great conversations with everyone. And, you know, the, the conversation inevitably kind of goes to, you know, the, the world's a little tense right now in some places. You know, there's, there's a little bit of stress and anxiety out there. And at the end of the day, I think on a normal year, school districts have an ability to make an immediate impact with you know, bringing kids in. But then there's the long term, obviously, helping them become productive citizens in society. But I think this year, I think it's really going to help. I'm hoping that two, three, four weeks in, kids are coming to school every day. And I'm hoping that we all collectively, myself included, take one big deep breath and say, okay, you know, we're here. And I won't even use the word normalcy. I'm just going to say, it, you know, to have our, us in a place where, you know, you are experiencing some of the things that we value, whether it be, again, your kid going to school and coming home and talking to you about their day at school or the, the you know, the Halloween party or whatever it is. Um, so, I mean, again, expect things to change and hopefully for the better. And even if we see a little spike in infection rates or something like that. If we keep doing what we're doing, you know, I'm confident they go down and we're able to get back to a better place. Just remember how we ended last year. We ended last year, I think, on a high note in terms of just our ability to, to be more free within society. I'm not even talking about just schools. I just, that's, that's what I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful that that's where we're going to be. We're going to get there. So um, anyway, I just really briefly just want to say welcome to all of our new staff. We have a number of great people that are coming on board. Many of them have already been with us in other capacities and now we're serving as classroom teachers and interventionists and, uh, you know, and tech, uh, tech support and things like that. So we've got some great stuff going on this year and it's very exciting. Um, I, as I said, I, I, well, I'm, <laughs> I think I said this in a, a communication, I've never been more excited to start the school year and if you walk around our district, talk to our staff, they're in the same place. So, Mr. Bedient, that's all I have right now. Okay, thank you. Um, do we want to, are we going to plan on doing, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so what, what we're going to do is we're actually going to move up the public, uh, public comment section. I know the room's hot and there's a lot of people in it, so we're going to bump them up. I'm going to do the board president's report. Um, I'm just going to start with that and then I have a statement that the board put together that I'm gonna read. Um, but as far as the board president's report, again, I wanna congratulate everyone. One week from today, the kids come back to school. Um, I've been on campus. Uh, West, West Ally was there and the marching band was practicing and playing. I had to take my daughter over to West Middle and there was tryouts going on. I come down the hallways here and the doors are decorated. The teachers seem like they got their classrooms rocking and rolling. Transportation's out doing their bus runs. Um, I mean, everyone's getting ready. I'm super excited about it. I was uh, invited to do the opening day video that's going to be sent out to the district. I was sick to my stomach all night, worried about what I was going to say and how is I going to screw it up. Um, I just want to thank everybody, though, for every all the hard work they've done. That well, I mean, you're getting videotaped to talk to the whole district. You get nervous. I don't see the cameras here, Molly, so I'm okay. You did a great um, job, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but I do, I do, I'm impressed with not only like I've always seen what my wife and what parents do to get their kids ready, but more this year than any year I've had a chance to see what the district does to get these kids ready. And then let's add on the heat and humidity. And I'm amazed that it, uh, that everything gets done the way it gets done. So I just want to thank everybody for how excited they all seem to be to start next Tuesday and uh, help me get my kids out of my house. Um, so that being said, I'm going to move on to the statement yeah, I, we have. Real quick, if I could just jump in, just yeah. to add to your point, that a lot of hard work, not just from our educators, but our buildings and grounds crew has really 
gone above and beyond our food services department yeah, our transportation else. i mean right it feel like you start thanking one person but you thank them all but our transportation department honestly they provided transportation for students for summer programming i mean um we had our summer school it department honestly yeah. we've had to move you know computers and get people connected so there's been a lot of a lot of hard work our administrators I'll, and planning and, i'll put it so. out there if i forgot you email me <laughs> and uh, tell me what you did and i'll talk about it next time <laughs> okay. uh, one of my favorite things is walking in and seeing these floors they look like they're wet. They're so shiny out in the hallways. Yeah. And I can't believe how like how beautiful these floors look every year. That's a lot of work. So it, it truly is. Anyway, truly is. thank you everyone for doing that. Um, I'm gonna read. So before we get started um, with our, our public session, I'd like to make a statement uh, from the board on masks. On August 23rd, the Erie County Department of Health and our County Executive Mark Polenkars held a press conference where they issued guidance and requirements for all pre-K through 12 schools. Within that document was an indoor mask requirement for all ages, age, for students aged two years and older. As Erie County is still under a state of emergency, Mr. Polenkars has the ability to issue these orders and we must comply. As a board, we are happy that the state and national governments have recognized how essential full-time in-person learning is to the students and we remain focused on bringing our students back at full capacity as safely as possible. We do appreciate you being here tonight and we sincerely appreciate your perspectives. If you have questions that we don't have answers for at this time, please make sure you leave your information with Ms. Latza and we will contact you directly. Thank you. Yeah, folks, we just wanna hear what, I know you folks wanna be able to speak, we just wanna hear what you have to say. We don't typically engage in a lot of dialogue, uh, but honestly, I've got a pen and I've got a piece of paper, I'm gonna write down uh, questions and we can make sure that we're responsive to people to the extent that, you know, that we can get back to people on this. So. You know, at the end of the day, the Board of Education doesn't have any more ability than, than I do or any administration here to override what the county has to say. I know some may have a different perspective on that, and I, it's not to diminish that perspective, it's just to give you the, the perspective that we have on the situation. So, um, but like I said, if any questions that re, uh, remain unanswered, or any questions that you have, uh, I'm going to be writing stuff down here, and I'll make sure that we get back to you in a timely manner. Good. Okay, so we'll call, um, I'll go up off the list I have first. Is that okay, Nicole? Oh, yeah. those are just attendees. Okay, so I can just call up if someone wants to come up and speak. I'll, I'll read the legal statement now. Okay. The public comment section is time set aside for the community to speak directly to the Board of Education. You should note that the, the first public comment section is for items not listed on the agenda, and the second one is going to be for agenda items only. Each speaker is given three minutes with a total allotted time to last more than 30 minutes. When called, please step up to the podium, state your name and address. Please be respectful in your comments and do not divulge any personal or confidential information. The information shared will be carefully considered and the appropriate person will contact you. If you'd like to be contacted again, please leave your information with the district clerk. And I promise we will get back to you um, with a... And we're just combining the two sessions. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to have the one session just this way people can speak is typically to be the agenda items first and someone may have, may have something they want to say in advance of that. So just all ears at this point. Would, uh, would anyone like to come up to the podium? Ma'am? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, honestly, we, we have to maintain the masks. Thank so you. And when you go back and sit down, why don't you sit next to the air conditioner? There's a chair right there. Oh, Gina Whalen. I have asthma. I'll do my best. If I pass out, these are my witnesses. Okay, um, so my name's Lisa Miller. And um, my first question, like I understand that your guys' hands are tied and that you're delegating the decision-making to Poland Carnes, as well as April Baskins is what I've been told. But... Um, there's no science, you haven't listed any science behind what you said besides the orders. So if you listen to the doctors that are constantly censored, they tell you the dangers of mask wearing and how they're saturated after 20 minutes. And then they've done studies on the tests, or excuse me, they've done tests on the masks that students wore last year. And they find meningitis bacteria, pneumonia causing bacteria. Our two-year-olds and pre-K, you know, toddlers, 
they can't wear masks and know how to change them and they can barely keep their noses from running without the masks. Um, but like I said, it's all based, it's not, none of that's based on science. So I don't understand why you're delegating it to people that don't even reside in Erie County. Cuomo got removed. Now they're letting in Hochul, a new dictator. The people that donated to her, according to the investigative post, they listed her donors. It's all unions. It's all taxpayer-funded money. People don't agree with that. That's not the majority of people. So what I'm going to do is come up with a petition, and I'm going to do it online to make it as easy as possible and gather the signatures for all the residents who don't want their kids masked and don't want them forced vaxxed with the graphene oxide that's been known to be in, it, in them. Um, I don't have a speech prepared, so I'm kind of going off the top of my head. But we should be concerned about the Taliban being fully equipped by Biden with $85 billion worth of equipment. 75,000 vehicles were left behind and not destroyed. 200,000 Black Hawk helicopters and all kinds of weapons and arson. The Taliban is working with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So our 20 years of lost lives was for nothing. Not to mention the gold that was under Building 7 was removed after 9-11. Like, that's how they got the gold out of there. And Larry Silverstein, who owned the Twin Towers, he took out an insurance policy six weeks before 9-11 that paid double indemnity, which means it pays double if it's an act of terrorism. They said that the, the guy's passports fell out of the planes and landed on the streets of New York City. Meanwhile, the buildings fell at free fall speed. We saw the explosions. There was, um, they had power outages a couple weeks before 9-11 where they had removed the bomb sniffing dogs that were normally in those buildings. And that's when the guys with black clothing and backpacks went and loaded up the bombs. And they detonated it to get everybody behind the Patriot Act, which they couldn't pass. It failed twice. They said it would need a new act like Pearl Harbor and that we would need to be attacked in order to get the American public behind it. So they always need a tragedy now they unleashed the coronavirus to keep people in their houses to finally get mail-in ballots passed and allowed, which people already for years have been worried about, you know, illegal elections or voter fraud. Kamala Harris has been on record saying that she's not um, trusting of the voting systems, and we know that the Dominion voting machines were hacked. There's proof. Look at the voter rolls for every state and every county. They don't match the official numbers. Aside from all the ground level fraud that did occur, there's proof of it. The people that know all this know all this. We cannot unknow it. So you guys can have whatever excuses you want for muzzling our kids. Our kids don't need to wear masks. They, they're not dying from it. There's not even one documented case in all of Sweden who last year continued their schools as regular with no social distancing, no masks. Not one case was said to, from a student to I, give to an adult. Not I, one. I don't mean to interrupt, but you're, you're at your yeah, three I'm, minutes here. Yeah, so. I'm fine. Okay. So. Are you, um, I didn't have anything specific to okay. say, but no, there's a lot of... I, yep. We got a lot of information out there. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. well, we do we do the list so we make sure the board meetings don't um, fill up too much so we can move to if they get bigger. What is your address for the record? PO Box 2443, Buffalo, 14240. And once you guys send me your address publicly recorded, oh. I would be happy to I live at 315 okay. Burnsdale Avenue, West Seneca, New York, 14224. Doesn't bother me any at all. Anyone else, Jen? Meanwhile, my wife is moving. We can talk about any other topics. Yeah, this is literally, um, okay. you know, soup so, du jour. Okay, so my name is Jen. I am at 47 Manhasset Street. Um, a little background, real fast. Um, I um, lived in West Seneca all my life. And, sorry. Um, I lived um, in West Seneca all my life, and then uh, three years ago, I had the opportunity to move to Florida. So I got to see how the school district down in Florida does. So um, my daughter um, missed the cutoff um, uh, by three days when she was in kindergarten. And uh, when we moved to Florida, she got um, it, um, offered to go into the um, gifted and talented program. 
Now, Wasanika had uh, the gifted and talent program way back. Um, I don't know when it was removed um, or why, but um, I want to, we work, um, you, the district works hard for the disability, um, the students that have disabilities, but there is no plan for kids that have exceeded the, the curriculum. And I want to know how we can get that um, uh, gifted and talented program back into the schools. The schools that um, my daughter went to in Florida, they had one teacher for the whole, st the whole school, for um, the school that she went to, and they went to different um, levels, um, K kindergarten through fifth, um, fifth grade, and they worked with the kids and gave them extra work gave them um, different um, levels of reading and writing and everything like that. So I'm hoping that West Seneca can get that back into the schools because you'll see more kids not disruptive um, with extra, curricula, uh, extra curriculum or anything like that. Um, the other thing that I noticed um, comparing to different school districts is the school district in Florida, they had their bus schedule set out in the beginning of the summer. We're, we have parents, I keep on having parents that, that in, um, in different groups. When's the bus schedule coming out? When's my student knowing to what, uh, what bus number is, where the bus schedule is going to be? The school, the, the layout of the neighborhoods has never changed except for when there's new builds. We should ha be able to have a set bus number for that area already in place and have the time frames are already in place. We, um, it's been forever that we should know. So I want to know how that can be implemented for the schools to get the gifted and talented program back and the school buses situated because parents are still waiting and they haven't had it. School buses are, school starts next week. We don't have nothing to show where the buses are going to be, how the school, um, the kids are going to be picked up, where and what times. So that's my concerns. So Jen, uh, I have thoughts on both those and we'll make sure that we're in touch with you about those. I, I will tell you the GT programming is less of a separate space. It's something that's infused. That said, we do actually have some new stuff going on this year. Um, and I'll get, I'll, we'll give you a call on both okay. those issues, okay? Thanks for taking the time to be here. Sure. sure. James Gibbons, 76 Sunset Creek Drive, West Seneca, New York. Can you hear me back there? I'll try. It's been a long day. So I guess I sent an email off to the board last week concerning that three-page policy that was created. And I guess my first question as a parent is, who developed the policy? Because from what I understand as a taxpayer in this, in this town and electing the school board members, it's actually the board's policy to create, it's responsibility to create that policy. Yes or no? I mean, um, that's what I see if, from your state law. I apologize. If you want to, the policy you're referring to is the three-page guidance for mask wearing. It energy. was a it was a summarization of the county guidance. So, but this is the policy. It's a summarization of the county guidance, Jim. It's not really a policy. Okay, so it's not a policy. Again, and that was kind of one of my questions: was the arbitrary nature of this summation itself? And one of the questions was. Under what legal mandate, what chapters of law in New York State and the county does this policy, why are we impinged on listening to the Erie County Department of Health and their recommendations? But the nice thing is for parents out there, from a discussion topic with talking to other parents on how we actually fight this in court, the nice thing is the State Department of Health Commissioner actually came out with guidance just on the 27th. But here, I'll, I'll tell you, here's the problem with that guidance. I don't know, did everybody read it yet? I'll read you the one paragraph here. The one sentence. <laughs> as determined by the commissioner based on the COVID-19 incidents and prevalence, as well as any other public health or clinical risk factors related to COVID-19 disease spread, any person who is over the age of two and able to medically tolerate a face covering may be required. What does that sound like to you? May be required to wear a mask. Does that sound like a legal mandate to you in the law? No, it does not. The nice thing for parents, what that does for us is, 
the state has just taken over all authority on releasing mass mandates. So now we have one entity to go to and go after in court, and that's the state. The last thing that we wanted to do was have to sue every county, every school district, because that just costs too much money. But now, at least now, we have one entity to go after, and once they lose in court, which they will, because we've seen what happened in court with Cuomo's executive orders and also with polling cars mandates. They were all thrown out of court when it, went, when it came to the COVID issues with, on small businesses and religious practices and even some school issues. So the question is, Jim, what do we get about do from 20 here? seconds. Oh, okay. Sorry, you get about 20 seconds. Okay, okay sorry. So anyways, okay. just so you know, here we go. These are the people, the politicians that are mandating us, our kids to wear masks. This was Kathy Hochul's fundraiser on August 18th. All the pictures are out there. We all see it. No one's wearing masks. None. Here's a picture from July 16th. Kathy Hochul attending an event at a SUNY college where you're supposed to be vaccinated and wear masks. None of the adults are wearing masks and all the kids are wearing masks. This is disturbing what is actually occurring in our community today. We're making decisions based on antidotes, not science. In fact, the National uh, Internet, or, or Institute of Health director, Francis Collins, on the 17th, even admitted that in a conversation, with, in an interview with Hugh Hewitt. Jim, you're, you're over your time. I'm oh, I'm sorry, sorry man. I'm That's sorry. Right. But he said all of these mass mandates on kids are based on antidotes and not science. So where do we go from there as a community? Do we actually look at the laws or not? Or we just assume? I understand people trying to be cautious, but there's studies out there that say the mass mandates aren't working. Louisville, University of Louisville, Kentucky just released one. Yeah. And, and it Jim, actually supports the CDC study. Jim, I'm sorry, we, we gotta stick oh, thank you, man, I'm sorry. Oh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, thank you for coming thank out. I think the, over there. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Samantha. I'm a mom of three here in West Seneca. Um, and I do just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to come and speak. I apologize, uh, your address? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 32 JC Lane, 14224. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. First time. <laughs> um, and I know that the issue of masks has been addressed multiple times, um, but I do appreciate this opportunity to just comment on it as a parent. Um, so thank you in advance. So over the last year and a half, government officials, media outlets, and school districts across the country have worked to convince parents that mask mandates are in the best interest of their children. And we have been told to follow them blindly and without question. Well, as a parent and a teacher, I do question. And that has led me to find that the current mask policies just don't make sense. As a parent, I am told my kids need to mask because COVID is a great risk to them. I did some research and according to the CDC, over 4.59 million children, zero to 18, have tested positive for COVID in the US. Of that number, 454 of them have died. This is a 99.99% survival rate for children. And so I have a really hard time understanding the emergency for our little ones. And so as a parent, I conclude that it's not a great risk for my children. I'm also told that mask mandates in schools are necessary because they are effective at stopping the transmission of the virus. Interestingly enough, a recent study done by the CDC found no significant difference in schools that required students to wear masks compared to schools where masks were optional. And I found that very interesting um, because in the new order released Friday, the governor and the commissioners made reference to three studies that are guiding and justifying the mask policies in this state. And I noted that none of them were done in this country and none of them were done in schools. And I'm just, I'm just wondering as a, as a mom, why this study by the CDC that was done in the US and was done in schools wasn't used to guide mask policy in this state. Um, and if that wasn't enough to make me question, uh, I also read that European countries such as the UK, Italy, Sweden, and the Scandinavian countries have, after looking at the data, chosen to exempt students from mask mandates. And so I'm just, I'm not understanding why their data is being ignored. And so as a mom, uh, my conclusion is that the mask mandates in schools are not necessary. A final thing I'm told as a parent is, it's just a mask. The kids are fine, they don't even complain. After some research, I found that the authors of a recent study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatric Section stated that their findings suggest that children should not be forced to wear masks. Dr. McDonald, a clinical psychiatrist, goes so far to argue that masking children is child abuse 
and there is substantial evidence that children have been medically, physically, and psychologically harmed by mask mandates. He also noted that masks do nothing medically for children, but rather they are a symbol of fear and anxiety. In light of these findings, I'm asking the board and the leaders in this district to have the courage to honestly question why we are mandating what we're mandating. Question those who are telling you to mandate it. I have read the evidence and I as a parent am not convinced. I am also asking you to fight for the right of parents to make those informed decisions for our children's health. We can no longer blindly follow when the well-being of our children hangs in the balance. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, thank Samantha. You. My name is Amber Black. I live at 85 Summit Avenue in West Seneca. Um, I have one child in going into middle school um, in this district. My concern lie in the mandates, which is obviously a popular topic, uh, topic um, via the Department of Health. I have attended several board meetings with friends and family in different school districts the past few weeks to understand the effect on Erie County as a whole. The information being proven and labeled ineffective to stopping the spread of COVID and aside from the fact that there have been children in every state, city, and school struggling mentally, physically, socially, and academically in school, those concerns continue to be ignored. I want to know the preventative measures that are being taken for proper wear and use of masks. The length of time one mask is deemed useful and at all effective before disposing and put, putting a new one on. To the proper way to wear a mask in regards to washing your hands before and touching the mask. Ensuring to only touch the bands or ties when applying or removing masks and ensuring you can breathe and speak comfortably through your mask. How mask breaks during lunch, recess, um, and you know the regular time that they're allotting for mask breaks during class time. Um, it's just, just how it's being handled um, is also very important to me. Uh, removing the mask and having a designated spot or bag to store safely during that time to avoid contamination. Placing in your pocket or on a shared surface with several other students, you can enjoy a variety of bacteria and viruses from cross-contamination. Having the resources in every classroom to properly wash your hands um, and not just cheap bottles of hand sanitizer laying around. Um, having the resources in every classroom. Um, masks, more masks available once one has been worn for hours in a building, um, which most have no air conditioning, if any at all do. Um, with sweat buildup, which in turn draw moisture and debris, deeming the mask even more ineffective as personal protection. I will not be responsible for the expense to uphold this mandate, nor would I put my child at risk if disposable masks are not readily available at any point in time to not have the ability to request a new unsoiled and uncontaminated disposable mask and a proper system in place for hand washing during school session. I'm sorry. This mandate is 100% harmful to our children in so many ways, and there is no one size fits all solution to it. I know there are parents in agreement to this mandate as their children have no issues doing so, and that is respected choice based on your children um, having no issue doing so, especially um, immune compromise, which you know is a big thing, and I totally understand that, and I, you know, I respect everybody's choice. Um, every parent should do what is best for their child. As far as COVID testing and quarantine guidelines, um, given by the Department of Health. I don't know if you guys touched on that um, at the last board meeting. I did watch it online. Um, stating if an individual has been vaccinated, they do not have to quarantine and a mandatory 10 days for those unvaccinated. And that is aside from the false positive and negative results that have been seen with testing. This is a far overreach and interference with our children's education. And at the end of the day is a passive aggressive segregation when you're fully capable of contacting and transmitting COVID and falling ill with severe symptoms regardless of vaccination status. Thank you. Thank you. Amber, if you want to leave your number, we be happy to get in touch, okay? I'm sorry? Um, I think we're good on Yeah, that. you've already been, yeah, yeah you've already had your, your yeah, three minutes. Yeah, we gave you three minutes. I yeah. appreciate it, though. Okay. Well, no, I, okay. I, if you stick around, I'll catch up with you after the meeting. I'd have no issues with that at all. 
each individual gets up to three minutes to speak. So, yeah. I know it's difficult for you here. If you'd like to stick around, I'll catch up with you after. But we're we're good on the three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm up for re-election this year if I run. So, obedient. Check the box or don't. Um, Ma'am, would you like to go or anyone? We good on everyone else? Okay. Next. Okay, so I think we're just on the next agenda item then. We'll move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. I appreciate you guys coming out for real, whether we agree or not. Thank you for talking and giving some information. All right, so I think we're up to our assistant superintendent's report at this point, right, Ed? Is that yes. where we left? Um, okay. Yeah, assistant superintendent's report. Okay, all right. Uh, I don't know if Mrs. Persico or Mrs. Fowler, Dr. Right. Cervoni. Oh, their names are over there. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Good evening. Uh, we are very excited to welcome back all of our staff tomorrow. Uh, many have been intimately involved in the planning of the professional development of staff, but I would like to give a special thank you to Jason Marchioli, who happens to be here tonight, for all of his assistance in working out the many, many logistics that go along with days of this magnitude. So we really appreciate all your behind the scene works. Jason, you don't get enough credit for what you do, so thank you. We, two weeks ago from today, held our Literacy Summit over at Clinton Elementary in the cafeteria. It was a fantastic day. Uh, Dr. Sue Sackowitz left us all feeling inspired and ready to move forward with our literacy initiative. Uh, we are ready for this. She told us so. Uh, <laughs> and we're really excited to be putting these pieces in place moving forward. In line with our Literacy Summit, we have held meetings with teachers and staff who have signed up for district-wide study teams based on a variety of textbooks that are all um, concentrating and focusing on implementing reading and writing strategies and techniques in the classroom. Teachers are receiving their books tomorrow, and we will engage with these staff in a variety of formats for collegial discussions based on the text and their implementation in classrooms. Uh, the next item I'm very excited about, we are ready to finally launch our inaugural implementation of our ELA and Social Studies Grade 8 Honors classes at the middle schools. Teachers have been hard at work to develop the curriculum and our directors and facilitators have also been in great support to these teachers as well. We will also launch our capstone experience class at the middle level. We are equally as excited to get this program up and running due to the pandemic pause we had in place last year. A special thanks to all of the faculty and administrators involved in the planning of all three middle school endeavors. Tonight we will present to you our, an overview of our district comprehensive improvement plan uh, Dina Stevenson, who is our consultant that has been working with the district for the past couple of years, is here to review the plan with you. Our plan is carried over as the designation is as well. Our priorities remain the same, but we have been able to shift um, and add to to extend those priorities and action plans to really carry out the focus of the plan. And you'll notice that this year's plan not only has an academic focus, but also has shifted its focus to the social emotional components as well. So. We look forward to all of these things. We're very excited. It's a new year, and I think that we just can't wait to see the kids and the teachers and get back to some sort of normalcy. The sooner, the better. So, any questions? Okay. Thanks, Thank you very much. Dr. Savoni, Mrs. Fowler, do you guys want to arm wrestle over it? Mm. Huh. Rock, paper, scissors? That's right. Or paper, rocks. Whatever. Because a dynamite wins all, I think. Good evening, everyone. Um, some updates from the Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Special Education. As Mrs. Parsico said, you know, we are looking forward to the return of our staff and our students as well. Um, in the upcoming Professional Development Days, our PPS and Special Ed Departments will be meeting with Mr. Winack, Mr. Lapuma, who is our Interim Director, and myself in various sessions. Um, we also have a session related to social-emotional strategies with a BOCES consultant, Greg Wazowski, who we're happy to have with us. Greg has worked with us in the past and is coming back to support us on this um, as well. Um, our teacher aides, our PPS staff, and our special ed staff will, will participate in that session. That session will include some tips and ways to support our students and our families, as well as some opportunities for them to reflect and take care of themselves. As we all know, we have to be in good, 
good state and utilize our social emotional strategies to be able to help others. Um, we've been busy hiring and filling our open positions. Many of those are on our agenda tonight. Um, and one specifically is our um, Director of People Personnel Services. So we are looking forward to Dr. Lagren joining our team and moving forward with all of the things that we've been working on. Um, she is on the agenda tonight um, to be recommended for that position. Additionally, uh, many student registrations continue to come in and we will see that historically, this has been a busy time, especially these last few weeks and into the first week of September, we anticipate that. We carefully review those registrations in collaboration with our building support where students are registering and also taking a look at any students with special needs and what those needs might be and how we can support those. Those may be district programs, they may be out of district programs, there may be other um, ancillary supports that we need to provide, but carefully looking at that so that when students enter our district, we can appropriately support them. Okay. Anything else um, or any questions, let me know. Thanks, Thanks Ms. Fowler. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you again. Uh, extremely busy time, uh, a lot of excitement and build up. You see the agenda. Thank you for your patience and, and fluidity as seemingly, uh, I don't know if we've ever hired this many people and brought people on to support our students. So it's a really exciting time. Uh, on the administrative side of the house, a ton of work has been going in in preparation through our bus garage, our transportation, our buildings and grounds, our custodial, our clerical teams to get these buildings ready. Uh, just recently updated some of our return to work guidance to make sure that our staff and, and our faculty are, are safe and understand the expectations. Uh, we've put a lot of things in place, uh, some that we've continued over from last year and some updates as we've gotten new guidance. Uh, was involved in a variety uh, of processes to get some new leadership in place, uh, worked through our, our library coordinator position, which I know was supported by this board, uh, which will be coming uh, on a future agenda. So a lot of exciting things, uh, a lot of really exciting staff members uh, that are returning and a lot of new faces that are just excited to work with our students. Uh, I would also just like to say, I know some of you have reached out uh, on our board with some questions. I, I, I welcome that. Thank you. If you're wondering on something or unsure of something, never hesitate to shoot me an email, give me a call. Um, I'm just excited. Uh, I'm enthusiastic about a great year. So thank you for your continued support. Uh, any questions on anything specific? No. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I Thanks. can't stress enough how much it is nice reaching out, asking the questions yeah. and you know, everything that the you guys have all done with getting us information and that has been really helpful thank you yeah mr field do you have any a couple of thoughts for how the business office has been working i know you guys have been a little busy lately as well especially with this with the transparency reporting and all that good stuff so uh, as matt said it's probably the busiest time of the year in the business office uh, wrapping up the 2021 school year, planning for the unfolding 2022 school year with all the variables we heard about earlier and that come every day at 5 o'clock, it seems, from the state or the county. Um, we also have transparency reporting, uh, which is another unfunded mandate. Uh, we have to reshuffle our budget, allocate it to buildings, break it out in ways we would not normally break it out and then publish the results after probably a year of commentary. Um, capital projects continue to drive our district and we continue to meet constantly about the uh, involving work, uh, where it's headed. We have bids coming up on phase two and uh, additional work scheduled for this year. And then we are in the middle of our annual audit, which you'll hear about uh, in October when we have a meeting of the audit committee and a presentation to the board. So. These are long days and um, the rest of the team is experiencing the same and we just appreciate your patience and hang with us and we'll we'll get school open and moving forward. Questions? Thank you. No, I'm great. Yeah. Oh. When will the Westfield be ready for football? I think they scheduled the opening. I believe they scheduled the opening. They'll of the be field there, yeah. In the next week or so. Yeah, they actually were putting the lines on the track today. And they're gonna so. play at West. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, we were a little ahead of schedule. We weren't. I, I think initially we talked about October for like a, the first game being able to be on the field. That's what so I thought. yeah, we're sure. a little ahead of schedule. Finishing up the track is very weather sensitive. So yeah, Mrs. Persico is out there actually painting the lines on earlier today. So she's she's been busy. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Okay, that's all for the assistant right, soups. Okay. We can go to the next. Uh... Now we can go on to some presentations. Mrs. Persico, would you mind, I know Dr. Stevenson was with us at one point a little while back, would you mind just doing a little introduction for the group and then uh, kind of well, welcome her up to the, uh, to the stage? Dr. Dina Stevenson has worked with our district for a couple of years now, and we have enjoyed tremendously her expertise in this area. She is approved consultant in New York State. She works with a variety of districts in and outside of the area. Um, she travels all over the place, and um, I think that Dina has helped us all to see that even though the designation came from maybe a place where originally it might have been a place of concern, she has shown us that with the proper supports in place that we can turn that frown upside down and really make a positive um, and really see tremendous gains from that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dina Stevenson, who will review um, the DSIP for us for the 21-22 school year. Please tell me the phrase, turn the frown upside down, is somewhere in the report. I, I looked at it. I didn't find it yet, but I'm hoping. So. I'm so upset that I didn't even think of that. Think I about it. Consider it. <laughs> So good evening and thank you um, for having me again. Um, I see that you have the slides in front of you, so I will not read them to you, but I know that this is being recorded, so um, I'll abbreviate them. How's that? <laughs> so as Perm said, I just want to go over the, uh, the DSIP, which is the District Comprehensive Improvement Plan. And so just three uh, items that I just want to uh, present to you tonight. An overview, just to remind you of ESSA accountability, just in case you don't recall that information. This year, I also want to share with you what the two middle schools are doing and what their priorities are. I think that that's important to share that information with you, as well as the district plan. Um, Carm already stole my thunder and shared that the priorities haven't changed. So, um, and I'll, I'll speak to why that is, and then share. Um, the progress that was made, there was actually significant progress in spite of the school closures, in, in spite of, you know, just the way instruction was uh, changed or altered throughout the year. Um, and then share the priorities and just some of the action items that the, your district has, um, your, your school leaders as well as teachers have identified. So. A page about me, we don't need to go into that. Um, ESSA accountability. ESSA, for those who do not know, it stands for Every Student Succeeds Act. If you've been in education long enough, it's been called School Under Registration Review, No Child Left Behind, but it pretty much just outlines how states can use federal money to support public schools. And so schools and districts will be measured annually by eight indicators. And so. The indicators at the elementary level are a little different than those at the high school. So the high school has, um, in addition to ELA, math, science, uh, progress in, English, in learning English, and then chronic absenteeism, they also have social studies, a graduation rate, and then college and career and civic readiness, and there's an index. So these are the measures that uh, the state looks at on a yearly basis for districts to identify if they should be on an ESSA accountability list. And so, as you may remember or recall, West Middle and, West and East Middle are considered targeted support and improvement schools based on specific subgroups. And you're talking about a small fraction of students, students that are probably not even at the middle schools anymore because it's carried over a course of a few years. So the subgroup at, at West Middle were Hispanic students, and at East Middle, um, the subgroup were black students. So as I said earlier, I wanted to share with you what the two middle schools had to do throughout the, um, the course of creating their school comprehensive education plan. So there were three new items that were added this year, um, and the, I believe that both the, the East and, and West Middle School did a fantastic job of 
uh, identifying this information. So they had to conduct student interviews and they were very insightful. So there were um, questions that students were asked really based on how has COVID impacted you? How has, um, you know, maybe having to learn remotely or just having to, you know, shift how you learn throughout this, this school year, how has it impacted you? There, was a, um, there were questions regarding social emotional learning and the students were very honest and open. And it was interesting because when I spoke to both principals uh, of from East and West Middle, they both said it was as if the students had gotten together <laughs> and come up with the same answers because they were all pretty consistent. Basically, we want to get back to school. We want to get back to school, but children are resilient, as we know. And so in both groups, they still felt like they learned a lot in spite of the shifts in how they, they had to learn um, this past school year. There was also an equity self-reflection that the staff and some students had to participate in related to the culturally responsive sustaining education framework. And then the last part was related to how learning happens. There is a document that um, the state education department gave to the schools, well gave to all schools, and they use that to kind of support that students learn because they're, they're social, they're social beings, especially at the middle school, and trying to put systems in place to make sure that even if, hopefully, um, if the school year had to shift like it did in the 2021 school year, the systems would be in place to support students and their concerns related to their student interviews. And so both schools had to come up with some commitments. Commitments, priorities, goals, they're, they're all the same. It's just lingo. Um, East Middle, uh, these are their commitments. They're going to commit to deepening connections among students, staff, and the community. And that was birthed from students saying that they missed being social. They missed being in school. And when they were in school, they missed the opportunity to really be able to connect with their peers. And so East Middle is committed to making sure that in addition to focusing on academic um, items that they're going to make sure that students feel that there is a welcoming and affirming environment when they come back um, um, next week. <laughs> and then they're also committed to strengthening their ability to provide a cohesive, relevant curriculum. West Middle, pretty much the same. And I have to say once again that East and West Middle, although we met separately, they really came up with some very similar um, commitments just based on their student interviews. And so they're also committing to a welcoming and affirming environment. West Middle um, wants to make sure that this includes deepening and reinforcing connections and relationships, not just with students, but with staff and the entire West Middle community, as well as um, strengthening and reinforcing and solidifying a robust curriculum. So what you see before you are the, two, the 2021 um, school year DSIP priorities, the District Comprehensive Improvement Plan priorities. They are the same as Carm already alluded to. And um, instead of reading the five that are there, I really would like to go into a little more detail about each of the priorities and what will the district look um, to as evidence um, of these being successful. So the first priority is establishing district-wide practices and systems that, and processes to use data and share data to inform instruction. So they've already, your, your district has already identified professional development dates throughout the school year, which is, is a solid practice. So teachers already know when these uh, data days are gonna be scheduled and the district is going to use this, the, the information from the data days as well as data and findings and conversations um, to determine continued instructional needs. So seeking what the teachers need and then using that information to drive the next professional development and then district-wide data dives into various data points. And so um, I think that this is a really robust priority because you're starting the school year already on September 24th with the first data dive. So to me, it's a it's a priority that shows that there is definitely a priority because dates have already been established. The second is established common literacy practices and strategies. So very similar to what Carm already mentioned about 
the literacy focus. And so building leaders are going to provide continuous on, ongoing professional development and those common literacy practices. Leaders are going to be scheduling classroom visits to support those practices. They're going to be infusing literacy strategies across content areas and grade levels. And then just continuing those conversations with teachers and school staff that are going to lead to the application of new ideals, which could be like a book study. The third priority is establishing a systematic approach to social emotional learning to ensure that the social and emotional needs of students, staff, and families are met. That is extremely important. And in order to do that, creating some district-wide systems of support as well as a way to track whether or not um, these supports and interventions are actually working. Because it's one thing to put a system in place, but to make sure that you know, what, whatever system that is in place, is it actually working and which interventions are working and where. The fourth is to increase the variety of reading materials, K-12 um, in all content areas. So I believe this probably already happened. Um, the Reading Rover um, throughout the summer distributing free books to students in the community, as well as each building will have the ability to purchase high interest books for students. So the building will have the opportunity to do that. It's not something that's going to be district driven. The individual buildings will be able to do that. And then all elementary level classrooms will have a new class set of books, which is huge. And last but certainly not least, Establishing a district-wide structure and priorities to effectively allocate resources. And resources don't necessarily have to be money, it could be staff and time. And so throughout the 2021 school year, Carm and I met. We met quarterly to discuss the decent priorities from the 2021 school year. We will continue to do, to do that, but now we're also going to be looking at the resources and making sure that where we said the resources were going to be allocated, they're actually going to be allocated. And if not, why? Um, so it's like, a, it's like an accountability check that each of us is um, putting upon ourselves. And intentionally scheduling meetings with the two middle schools to make sure that their priorities are being met as well. And it's, about, it's really about support. And so I'm a firm believer that if something's on your calendar, <laughs> it gets done. And that's it. Any questions? I have a couple. Yes. Um, I don't know. Am I on? Yep. Okay. Um, were all of the kids in the district interviewed at the middle school level? No, it was a random selection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are we, are, is the board able to see those interviews? Yeah, you should be able to see them, yeah. Okay. And um, what specifically put us on this plan? I, I saw the factors, mm -hmm. um, but is it is it actual grade point averages or is it tests? It's a, it's a three through eight assessment. Okay. The, the ELA and math assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. Oh, Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Dina, can you just talk a little bit about what happens if we remain on this list for another year? I think that's that's something. Because right now we're TSI. There's also they love acronyms. Now there's CSI is the next one. Yeah. So, so TSI. Um, is, is less stringent in the sense that, you know, the district has hired me to support the efforts to make sure that, you know, you, you create these priorities and um, we support the schools to get them off of the, off of the accountability list. Uh, it's going to be about a couple of years, um, but if you continue to stay on the list, you will then become a CSI um, district, which basically means that the someone from the state will come in and the accountability is is more um there's more accountability because now there isn't the flexibility of creating your own priorities the person from the state education department will identify what your priorities are based on an internal audit and so that's not that's something that you don't want to happen because it becomes it's not sunshine and rainbows anymore <laughs> it's not there's just a, a ton more accountability. And so the hope is that the school year will not um, be fragmented like it was last year so that you know, students can, can be in school. Um, it is aligned to the state assessments, though. And so 
um, and they're not going anywhere. And so until that accountability is no longer aligned to the state assessment, um, the state assessments have to be, should be a priority. But yeah, I guess yeah. for me, I just, you know, when we talk about high stakes testing, people say these aren't high stakes anymore, but they are. They are, they're very high, yes. And because that, <laughs> that's what's gonna keep you on the list. Yeah, so philosophically, that's a problem. Yeah. Because how are we, how are we really determining our own goals when we're really just put on this plan according to test scores? Well, because what we're doing is identifying, um, you know, where the gaps are. And so, I mean, and I've said this before um, at public meetings as well as privately, West Seneca School District, is, it's, a, it's a good school district. It really is. I mean, there's no, I, I live in Orchard Park, so I've lived in the area all my life. So I know it's a, it's a good school district but there's always room for growth. And so unfortunately, it took this assessment to kind of trigger this targeted, you know, this target district accountability. So as I've said to school leaders in the past, the goal is to look at where the strengths are and where the weaknesses are. And so we're, we all have room for growth. And so when you look at, let's go back. When you look at these priorities and you look at priorities one and two, those are systems that were in your district, but they weren't consistent systems. And so when you focus, I'm a, tr I'm a firm believer, and when you focus on um, something, it does expand because you're focused on that. And so those common literacy practices and strategies that not only teachers are doing, all teachers are now going to be doing them. You understand what I mean? So it's like. No, I do. I just, yeah. I guess for me, I just, it, it, it's a little bit bothersome because um, I don't feel like the state assessments are a true reflection of quality teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, to me, it's a little upsetting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just got to get it out there. Yep. And Molly, if I could just jump in there too. You, if you notice, nowhere in any of this is New York State assessments really even mentioned other than to say that that's one of the metrics. I think the good news here is that focusing on, you know, you're taking direct feedback from kids, from teachers, and, mm -hmm. you know, focusing on what it is that they feel they need to be successful, you know, and it's interesting that there was a yep. little bit of con consistency between both sides of town. And when I think of data, uh, I don't think of just the three-year assessments. I, I mean, it's I something know, we have to look at. And yeah, I, Mrs., oh, and I, yeah. but Dr. Stevenson just said it was based on three through eight data, testing data, so. This, the reason that we're on it is, right. yes. But I mean, right. I guess we don't have to just focus on the testing data. I think we have other opportunities to be able to focus yeah. on other things too. Like if you sure. like, what another data point is, I remember two years ago going into one of our data days, going into a class over Clinton Street Elementary and sitting and watching, uh, I think it was the third grade teachers, all the teachers were doing it, but I think I was in third grade in kindergarten, and the teachers were looking at writing samples, and they were all looking at like anchoring charts, and they were having really good conversation about, you know, they all looked at the same ones that kind of rotated through and pointed out different aspects of the writing samples, uh, which to well, me, Matt, that was powerful. I, I mean, I think it's all, like, it's all reflective, like quality teaching and learning, it's all reflective. It just bothers me that the primary reason we're on this is three through eight testing, yeah. when we know that that's not a genuine reflection of good teaching yeah. and learning. So I and just have to say that. It yeah. really, it bothers me that yeah. we're put on this plan because of that. I'm, I'm not and thrilled I, either, Molly, but yeah, the, this is the sunshine and rainbows I'm making and here, I, so. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. And yeah. um, because it doesn't change what we do here. We, we educate children. And, and, um, and, and, and you but, know what, Molly, that is absolutely correct. And so where I was going with the, you know, West Seneca is a, a good school, we can use this, you can use this plan, and this is what I say instead of sunshine and rainbows, let, let's, let's use this as a, as a means to make uh, West Seneca School District a great school district, you know, in, you know nationally ranked. Uh, folk, you know what I mean? Focus on those things that, you know, there were maybe some holes in, in, in instructional practices, and maybe it's only in a few buildings, maybe it's just a few teachers. But if we can put a, a, consi a consistent system, excuse me, together to look at data, how you're looking at data, how you're sharing data across the district, so it's the same in every building, looking at common literacy practices and strategies, that's only going to improve what you're already doing. Yeah. I've seen instruction in this district, and it is great. It is, and it's surprising that you're on this accountability list. But let's use it for good you know, let's use it, use the funding that you have, use the support that you're getting 
to really turn this district into a district where people from Florida are contacting you saying, what are you guys doing up in, in West Seneca? Where is West Seneca? We want to come and see the amazing things. Like you're, you're going to be um, having a math lab at the middle schools, um, and your leaders are extremely excited about those academic labs that are going on over there. That is birthed from this accountability. So there are some new things that are coming because of this accountability in spite of how you got on the list. I understand, I, I absolutely understand that it is disheartening that you're on this list because of the ESSA accountability guidelines, but let's use it for a way to hone in on some practices that maybe weren't as consistent as they could have been. And and we're on this accountability list because of all of our district test scores or that no, small subgroup? The small subgroup. And, and we are and not, yeah. That just made my yeah. point. Right. We're not alone. Uh, you keep no. pretty busy. They're, I'm most, very busy. Most other districts have, especially if, if some of the uh, uh, neighborhoods. Orchard Park is. I know that yeah, my yeah. husband works there. So sure, I, I'm sure that you know other districts also are on the list. I know. This is something new, you know. So it is it just West Seneca? No, it's not. And no, uh, no, it's, it's not it's not all the test scores are bad, it's just a certain subgroup. Very small. Like those small. two subgroups yeah. are what put us on the list. Really what percentage does that make up of the total population? I don't have that data oh, okay. in front of me. I'm sorry. It's pretty small. Yeah, it's pretty small. It is. It's Can really I ask small. you a question? Uh, what absolutely. comes next after this? What's the next step? So that's a great question. Yeah. So <laughs> the state assessment data. Okay. That's, you know, having, making sure that there are enough people in those subgroups taking the assessment um, and doing well on them. Okay. Because that's another thing. So although it's a small portion of students who took the assessment, mm -hmm. those who took it did not do well. Okay. So okay. That, that's a reality. Right. Yeah. I think from my perspective, I think you look at some things take care of themselves if you really focus on, I think, as I heard it, Molly, I know you just said it, good quality teaching and instructional mm -hmm. practice. Got cut out there for a second. But if you focus on that, how is it that you're delivering, you know, your literacy focus, right? That's not tied specifically. You still look at the standards. You still have conversations, which standards are, uh, you know, maybe the bigger chunks that we want to try. Supporting, sorry, keep going in and out. How are we supporting our students really is what it comes down to. So thanks. I just feel like things will take care of themselves. That's been my experience. Um, things tend to take care of themselves. I think if we just make it a priority to be deliberate in our instructional practices. So that's where you know, it's a good, you know, good exercise to be able to go through. Again, to some, I'm not happy to be on the list either, and I'm not happy the reason why. But I, so I share that with you. But again, if we've got this opportunity to be able to come together, then we'll make them, this is the lemonade, I guess, portion of it when we get lemons, so. Who, who, who funds all the, you mentioned um, all the elementary classes will get new books. Who funds that? Is that our district or no, is it so through there's, the? there's a grant. That's a great question. There's mm -hmm. a school improvement grant. The district gets a, 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 a grant as well as East and West Middle School also get a grant. Okay. So great. all of that is funded through that great and okay. i want you to see of the priorities we don't mention the three through eight assessment we we, we focus on nope. instruction we focus on what great teaching mm -hmm. you know is and reading. so never is it you know doing practice assessments or anything like that it's focusing on instruction because if the three through eight assessments are standards based and we're focusing on standards those students who take the assessment should, should do well. That's it, because that's just one measure. It's just, you know what I mean? So Yes, it's yeah. just one it, measure, it but that measure put us on this plan. Unfortunately, so. it did. Yeah. Any other questions? Are you, um, are you taking off right away, or will you have a few minutes afterward? I know there's a parent who'd like to meet you. Oh, I can, I can stay. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, Get bored or I can give her my contact yeah. information yeah. as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Still with us, sir? Yes, sir. Excellent. Thank you. We'll move on to the next presentation. I believe we got. Um, can I do? 
In her packet, I don't seem to have a copy of it. Of the professional yeah. development? Oh, let's take Can this I one. Yeah, copy? absolutely. Oh, wait, no, I've got that one. What are you looking for? His. His? Oh, his. It is his, yeah. Oh, no, it's hers. Her pro oh, yeah, take mine. I, I, I mean, I can get I just printed it myself, to be honest with you. Yeah. Are you mind giving it to me? Okay. Okay. I'm used to sitting over there where I can't see it. <laughs> so Mr. Marchio is going to be presenting our district professional development plan. Thanks, Jeff. Very good. Thank you very much for having me this evening. My name is Jason Marchioli. I'm the assistant principal at West Seneca West Middle School and also the district facilitator of professional development. And I thank you for having me here to share our professional development plan review for our upcoming school year. So as a condition of receiving Title IIA funding in accordance with New York State law, every district is required to develop an annually updated professional development plan. And these funds provide, excuse me, these funds Provide, are provided to us for the purposes of increasing student achievement consistent with the standards, improving quality and effectiveness of our educators in this district, and increasing the number of educators in this district who are effective in improving student academic achievement. It also is geared towards providing low income and minority students greater access to effective teachers, principals, and other school leaders. And each year, our district superintendent, Mr. Bystrack, is required to certify this plan and that state that it meets the guidelines set by New York State education law. The planning implementation and evaluation plan were conducted by a professional development team, which included administrators, curriculum specialists, higher education representative, teachers, and parents. And I want to especially thank Mrs. Persico for leading that robust review that we conducted a few weeks ago, as well as the teachers and parents in this community, along with Mr. Dalbo and Mr. James Serpone from Buffalo State College. And we asked Mr. Sircone to join us because we do have a very robust literacy charge this year. And he is a member of the English Language Arts Department at Buffalo State. And he has also provided us with some student teachers that have done a nice job in our district. So the partnership that we currently have with Buffalo State is flourishing. And it is really revealing some, some nice results. So the goals of our plan this year uh, really have five components. The first is culturally responsive, sustaining education. And I love the overarching belief that we have right now that understanding our students' lives gives them that sense of community. It sets them up for success. And it's something that we are really doing in this district, and we're doing it well. Mrs. Fowler, I know you mentioned Greg Rosowski from Erie One Boses. He has been doing an exceptional job specifically in this field and preparing our educators and our team to welcome our students, to make them feel loved, nurtured, and understood. So that is a big component and drive in our district this year as part of our professional development plan. The literacy component too, and I know I mentioned Mr. Circoni from Buffalo State, we had asked him in the professional development plan review, what area do you see students need the most support in? And he had shared that writing with empathy and writing with perspective is an area that he really could would like to see growth in from a lot of our learners. And consistent with a nice long linear plan that we have in our district, not shortly after our review, we had met with Sue Stakowitz, who had given us a literacy presentation. She turned a low performing school completely around and shared with us the literacy initiatives that we plan to utilize this year and resonated a lot of the same things that Mr. Circoni said at Buffalo State. So to put this systems thinking action in place and to hear this from so many educated people who want to see our students do well, it tells me that we really are on the right path. And academic intervention services, another very important component to our professional development plan this year. We have our math and English lab that we are going to start next week. We also have increased academic intervention service support taking place in our classroom. And as early as this Thursday, we are going to have training in those programs for some of our staff members. And much similar to number one, the social emotional learning piece. We just wanna make sure that our students feel welcome, that they are socially aware of themselves, that they are socially confident, and that they feel that in West Seneca, this is a place where they can come learn, safe, and be successful. I truly believe that when we provide our students with those opportunities, we create a healthy community of learners and that bolsters success. And last but not least, number five is Google Classroom. That was our professional development plan initiative last year. 
we had to make sure that we provided a unilateral platform for all of our students and families district-wide in the event that, excuse me, because when instruction needed to take place virtually or in a hybrid setting, offering our families that single platform really facilitated learning for their children, and I think it benefited our staff as well. So those are the five main components for this year's professional development plan. I also would like to take a moment and share some of the highlights of our plan this year. The new teacher academy and mentoring program, I have to openly say this is my absolute favorite part of being the professional development facilitator. <laughs> Dr. Cervoni, thank you so much. This past week, I conducted a three-day session with all of our new hires in the West Senior Auditorium. We had 35 hires, no, exactly 35 hires that joined us. All of our hires joined us all three days for the entire session, except for a couple of our teachers who had to miss an hour because they're already coaching in our district. What that tells me, Board of Education, is the efforts that you have put in to developing robust interview panels is working. Because what I'm seeing is a group of new educators in our district who are passionate, commitment, and committed and geared toward helping our students achieve success. And all of our new hires are paired with a mentor, a tenured teacher in their building, in the same content area that they can touch base with at any time if they have any questions regarding how to deliver better instruction, how to just perform overall better, or any questions that they have about our district. And I think that's a really nice piece that we have available to our new hires. And the Teacher Center, they have done an exceptional job of providing offerings to our teachers to help prepare them in areas that they want to improve. You can see that their goals are focused on three key areas, and that's providing professional development to enhance and deepen teacher content knowledge, providing professional development and support for integrating technology into curriculum and instruction. And last year, teachers signed up for so many Google classes and technology-based courses that we probably remember we had to add even more. Yep. And that just underscores the commitment that the educators in this district have to be ready to help our students succeed. And last but not least, support and facilitate goal setting, SLO de development, and professional development evaluation sessions to assure that alignment of those plans and priorities align with the region's expectations. Very, very briefly, I'd like to share with you that since last year, our charge focused on Google Classroom and the applications associated with the G Suite. We spent half of the day in our new hire orientation, giving that same workshop to all of our new hires. Since they'll be joining us next week, excuse me, since they're joining us this school year for instruction, I wanted to make sure they could start the school year with the exact same professional development that their colleagues received in the previous year. I believe it allows them to hit the ground running and be prepared to best service our students. So the professional development plan alignment, this plan must be aligned with New York State content and performance standards, must be aligned with the professional development standards, must be articulated and across all grade levels, must be continual and sustained, and it must indicate how classroom instruction and teacher practice will be improved must also indicate how teachers in the district will participate, and it must reflect congruence between student and teacher needs and district goals and objectives. Upon review, we believe that our plan this year, Mr. Bystrike, does meet all of those New York State expectations. And last but not least, the plan compliance. It must describe and implement a mentoring program, which I just shared a bit about. It must provide teachers with opportunities of completing 175 hours of professional development every five years between our superintendent's conference days faculty meetings, data days, and teacher center offerings. We easily eclipse that number that they set for us. And it must assure that our teaching assistants and long-term substitute teachers participate in the professional development activities as well. And naturally, with a sense of community, all those individuals will certainly be joining us on all of those days. It must also state the average number of hours each teacher is expected to participate in professional development during the school year covered by the plan must describe how teachers will be provided professional development opportunities directly related to student learning needs. It must provide staff with training in school violence prevention and intervention. Dr. Cerrone, we do meet that with the GCN compliance training. And then we must provide professional development to all professional and supplementary staff who work with our students with disabilities. And again, upon review, Mr. Bystrack, we do believe we meet that, those New York State requirements. That does my con conclude my presentation. Sorry. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions you may have.
I, I'm just going to say thank you. I think over the past year, year and a half, uh, you, Jay, have really pulled people together in an outstanding way to be able to bring, you know, and especially with our tech integrators too, but also with our curricular leaders to really bring some meaningful professional development to the district. You've got nothing but praise from your colleagues. I will share that with you. So I really appreciate all the work that you put into this. So thank I you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Bystrack. And I also have to share that planning agendas for opening day activities, it, there's a lot that goes into it. And there are times that I need to reach out to Ms. Persico, Ms. Fowler, Dr. Cervoni, Mr. Bystrack, and I, I want to especially thank the four of you. You have always provided exceptional guidance and good quality ideas, and I'm confident after working on this professional development plan that, like I said, we have a nice long-range linear plan that's geared toward building student success. It's been nice, honestly. I know you and Carmen have been working closely on that, so thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I have a question for of you, course. if you don't mind. I was looking at your um, the professional development plan focus, and I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on the cu culturally responsive sustaining education. Like, how are you, we're, you're doing professional development in those areas Absolutely. with our teachers. Can you just expand upon that a little bit? Sure, and can, one of the things I always say during our new hire orientation is that this job is about taking care of people mm -hmm. and building relationships and getting to know our students. During the orientation, we took a bus tour so our new hires could become familiar with the great communities in this district. And as I mentioned, we have some trainers from Erie One BOCES who do an exceptional job in that specific area. But we also talk about it in our faculty meetings as well as on the staff development days, the importance of getting to know our students, learning about our students, we talk about the importance of our educators meeting our students at the door, which so many of them do as soon as they come in. Tell me about how your day is. I have a, a teacher shared a new orientation that one of the things she does is fist to five real quick so the students can show up what kind of day they're having, a five or a one, and kind of tells them where the student is at, or it's a thumbs up, thumbs down, or the, mm -hmm. or the halfway thumb, just to know where the students at, are at emotionally. And choosing the right opportunity where they can speak with those learners and figure out, hey, tell me a little bit about what's going on. Tell me what you might have going on at home. Working with our counselors and our PPS staff. We have support groups from the University at Buffalo that have been providing us professional development as well. But what the overarching message is, the more we get to learn about our students, the more they will feel that sense of belonging, and that creates a healthier classroom that's geared towards helping them reach success. Okay, so how I understood it is that you're using that as a way to get to know your students better and understand what their home is and how they're you know how they are and how what they believe in what their beliefs are that's exactly right, right. absolutely we had open house for grade seven and eight at west middle today mm -hmm. and it was i know i speak for so many people it was just awesome to see yeah, our students. i was there you were there you were <laughs> yeah. there it was awesome to see our students in the building meet their parents learn a little bit about what they like okay. see our students maybe struggling open their lock and mm -hmm. i reassured them hey i will be in the hallway for the next two weeks to open locks and help decipher schedules and by the way tell me what you like to do for fun tell me okay. a little bit about your summer and again it just creates that sense of belonging and when our students feel comfortable it allows them to shift their focus towards learning and, and i love that that that's the, the direction that we're headed okay thank yeah. you so I just would add to that a little bit too. So there are some new requirements for, you know, from the state education department that, you know, we were initially thinking, you know, let's take the ground running opening day, but some of the feedback we were getting from our teachers is they really needed to be able to have some time to collaborate to kind of prepare for the upcoming year. So, you know, look for maybe a little bit more of a rollout specific to some of those requirements or standards. And there'll be some, honestly, it's going to consist of possibly some community forums, uh, just having some conversations and communication, you know, throughout the district as well and talking about what that framework operates within. There's a little bit, it's a little involved there, but I think we have some flexibility to be able to actually, you know, sit down and kind of have people digest it when their heads aren't thinking about, I've got, you know, 25 kids coming in my classroom, you know, in a little while. So we just, you know, we, we kind of took a pause and stepped back and said, right. and we're focusing on exactly what Mr. Marchioli was talking about in terms of really getting to know the kids that are in the room with us uh, right. to start off. I, I, every, it's funny, you're talking about these 35, you know, folks that came through and every single one of them, it was the same message. If in a typical year, you take a couple of weeks to really kind of set your parameters, get to know your kid, take as long as you need this year. I said the academics are going to come when they come, but right now we need to basically love them up, get to know your kids in the classroom, and it's just who they are as people. Because right now, if they're not engaged, if they're not dialed in, you know, there's nothing else we can do. Some of the bigger areas that people focused on concerns where, like you talk about your social and emotional well-being, your engagement, uh, academic, you know, uh, maybe a, a gap or whatever it might be. I don't think you can get at the academics 
uh, or the engagement if you don't have the relationship. So that's kind of just to, I guess, to elaborate on your point a little bit, that's where some of that focus has come from, especially for the start of the school year. So Great. sorry, I went a little long on that, but so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, even with that mask on, you could see how excited and passionate you are to talk about this. I'm ready. I'm so ready to just That's have awesome. a building full of kids and just be in the hall and, like I said, open locks for an entire day and help them navigate schedules and find <laughs> classrooms and just create that sense of relief and just awesome. that makes our students feel like, hey, this is my home and they got my back here at, at school. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you both you guys for the presentations. Appreciate it. So we did number three. Yeah. So four we're gonna that, right? Yep. Okay, so now we'll move on. Um, looks to me like we can we can do four A through four C. Uh, may I have a motion to accept four A through four C? I'll move. Jan, may I have a second? I'll second. Um, Liz? Excellent. Um, we have any conversation about 4A through 4C? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five to zero. Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna create a certified position. Um, so that would be 4D. May I have a motion to accept 4D? I'll move. Liz? Yeah. I can't. I can't. Am I low? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take Liz. How about a second? Sure. I'll second. Pete? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pete. Do we have any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? No. 5 0. And now we will do 5A. We are abolishing a classified position. I may have a motion on that. I'll move. Molly, mm -hmm. may I have a second? No, oh, second. Pete, we have any discussion on that? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone against? 5 0. And 5B, we will create a classified position. May I have a motion for that one? I'll move. Pete, may I have a second? I'll second. Molly, thank you. We have any discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone against? 5-0. My, uh, my notes tell me here that we could look at moving on 5-C to 6-J. If we um, have someone who can accept that, uh, give us time to look through it, of course. I'll move. Jan, may I have a second? I'll second. Second? I'll give us some time to look at it for discussion. Okay. Any discussion on anything? I'm in no rush. I know Molly's still looking. Okay. Everyone good? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? 5-0. And I will say at some point in there, normally is where you or someone else would introduce new hires and people joining the district or taking on a new role, correct? Uh, that is true. And I know that actually the board did receive an email uh, from well, an applicant just moments before the board, uh, just so excited. and. One of the things we certainly miss, because that's really a fun time. Yes. We usually do it with tenure, and we usually do it with new hires. People like to bring their families, but I'm sure they're equally as excited. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is a missed opportunity for sure. Give them, everyone at home watching, a hello and a welcome <laughs> to the district. Yeah. Um, I do miss that, and I do look forward to getting back into that. Yeah. And I did get the email, and it made me kind of, oh, yeah. I wish, you know, that's, it's always fun, though, watching you scan the room to see. Like who's here, who's not here. I so. just like watching parents try to keep little kids from like squirming and running all over the place. So. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, reports. Um, let's see, 7A and 7B. May I have a motion to move on those? All of seven? I'll move. 
Pete, thank you. May I have a second? I'll second. Uh, Molly. I think Molly beat Liz to the punch, right? <laughs> Molly, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Oh. oh, anyone against? Five zero. Um, also here, it looks like we can move a new business. All of eight. There's some really great stuff going on in here. Um, yep, looks like we can do all of eight. May I have a motion to move on all of eight, and I'll give you guys time to look through it. I'll move. Liz, mm -hmm. may I have a second? Am I, am I allowed to second? All right, I'll second it. I'll second all of eight. I'll give you guys a second to look through. Let me know when you're ready through eye contact. Can I can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, were all of these contracted last year too? All of these preschools was it like anybody new or um, were these all? Did get, we use these? These were all the same ones from okay, last year. Okay, just wondering. Yeah. Okay, that was my question. Excellent. Uh, any other conversation? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Five zero. We do not need to do number nine. So that would be number um, 11. We could do board discussion. Anything the board wants to discuss at this point? Um, did we do nine? I'm sorry? Did we do nine? Eight? I didn't really care for nine a whole lot no it's nothing we need to move on <laughs> okay it's Sorry, just informational Will. stuff all right i should have said that out loud i kind of muttered it i apologize no problem. <laughs> um 11 uh, board discussion anyone have anything they want to bring up i've got one or two things i Dan? just i just want to comment that i'll be attending the delegate assembly uh, meeting at erie county school boards next week and then uh the legislative meeting a couple weeks after that so We'll see what's happening. <laughs> Excellent. Anyone else? Anything good? Anything fun to say? I do want to oh, go ahead. Yeah, we, we, did, we were talking um, just as newbies on the board that um, it would be helpful if um, the board actually had an opportunity to orientate new members beyond just um, a brief hour meeting. Yeah. Um, you know, Erie County School Board, we went through, um, you know, our orientation there, and it's very broad. Um, but we, f we really feel like as new members within the district, you know, every district obviously operates a little bit differently, and we think it would be really helpful if um if new board members had a, a deeper orientation within the school board so we were just going to suggest that mm -hmm. um you know that maybe that be one of our goals this year um to put together a, a structure or skeleton of orientation for new board members because just like mr marchioli said um you know it's essential uh, it's crucial for for incoming teachers to have a solid orientation and understand curriculum and how you know the district operates mm -hmm. and um and we feel like yeah we any new like board member could use it. that too yeah you know used well, absolutely yeah. i yeah. i think i've experienced firsthand what you guys have like I think, how many years have been on the board now i don't i'm know. not like keeping five? track <laughs> <laughs> i got one more at least we'll see how that goes <laughs> um but every year i stress out about i'm having conversations and it's like, okay, are the new board members filled in on this? Do they know about this? How do we catch them up on this? So I agree. And I would, I would, I would think you guys have a lot on your plate right now. You've taken on a lot. Maybe we get in a couple of months and start building on something for the next, you know, again, hopefully, you know, one or two new board members or whoever joins us the next week. It's built. But, like, like, let's give it a month or two to – kind of get through our opening and we can kind of I don't want to just volunteer you guys for that but maybe a, a, a group yeah. of us can kind of form what, what what would we like to find out and how would we like to find it out and then work through it I mean I know Nicole's done a great job of putting together our binders and that sort of stuff and um, but I'm not sure how your orientation even went I believe you met with administrators mm -hmm. um, for a little while and then you met with 
Yeah, more specifically bored. You yeah. Know, just, no, I know. I'm saying I'm, like, I'm. You know, what do you do in this situation? Mm -hmm. Who do you go to? Yeah. You know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Those. Yeah. Um, it would just be. It would be nice. Yeah, I love. Yeah. I love that idea. So it's definitely would, something we should develop. I would yeah. definitely yeah. suggest it for the incoming new board members before the the July meeting. Yes. That they have more information because you come in and you have to. You vote on right. all these yeah. things, and you have no idea about so half of them. I know one of the things that I kept bringing up was, and I guess I'm sure it's not legal or it's not allowed. I keep kept thinking, like, why do they have to be sworn in the same day we're making major decisions for the entire year? Like, is there? Right. There's no, and I believe we looked into it, and there's really no legal overlap to bring them in any sooner. Or, well, okay. Okay, so so it is. There is a little bit we can. Okay. Yeah, and I'm just thinking since you guys just went through it, maybe we can get that feedback and then use that to okay. build. Yeah, the meetings in May. I mean, you've got until July to. So you got a, almost a couple of months time frame to come in. So kind of to your point. So. Yeah. There's yeah. space. Yeah. 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 yeah I just don't think we. Because everything's just like um, time-wise, it's just so condensed, and right. it and can be really overwhelming. Yeah, and once you're elected, until you're sworn in, what's the, I mean, what's the, the uh, we could we, we, can, them we on. can give a lot of good information. Well, I, yeah, I okay. think I'd be, mm -hmm. honestly, I just, me personally, like, you know, it's funny, we were talking, we say, okay, well, let's not overwhelm, but like what, I'd be really curious to hear, not that you have to say it right this minute, but like, what sorts of things were helpful? What would you like to have known more about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's, uh, you know what I mean? Like it's sitting on the other side of the table, just be really helpful for yeah. me. Cause that's something we did talk about and we've done like what we did this year. Honestly, we, we haven't done it that way before where we kind of sat and I feel like at a certain point your mate, your brain has to turn a little to mush when you're, okay, now this person's going to talk to you about everything they do right. for their job. So it, I would love to hear any perspective that you have on that. I'd be would, happy so. to do that. And I, I do know one of the other, one of the other things about it is we have the election, and then we have the, you know, till you're sworn in. But almost everything we do is public. Yeah. So it could. Except for the launch codes. You don't get those until July. So. I, I don't have those yet. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, it'd be great, it'd great to get the feedback from you guys. And then either one or two of you and someone who's maybe been, been here a few years um, can kind of formulate a nice orientation for that. That'd be great. It's any consolation. My first board meeting that I uh, attended, I mean, you know, as, as a board member in 1988, uh, they said, now that we're going to go into executive session. So I packed up my things and my coat and put my coat on and everything and started to leave. And they said, where are you going, Jan? And I said, well, I thought that was for just the executives, the officers. <laughs> so it happens to everybody, <laughs> folks. So we've, we've come a long way, at least. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Any other uh, ideas? Um, one question I had for you: uh, How are we looking on the bus apps this year? Were they going to be kind of active, or I don't want me to throw you on the spot. No, no, that. I'll check with Miss So Great. I mean, we still have it; it's still fully functional. So okay. I'll talk to her about okay, it. Okay, just yeah. curious. You know how much I love them, I but know. I know we're talking about um, uh, the information coming out, yep. Yep. and I know we'll get into some reasons later why it's, it's closer than it. You know, it's, it's a close call on that. But the bus apps are super helpful. I know yeah. last year they were a little tricky because, well, kids weren't coming to school. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I'll yeah. find out from Linda, and I'll shoot an email to the board probably tomorrow, to be honest with you, as to when we expect that online. line. So. The, other, the other thing, I, I appreciate that. The yeah. other thing I wanted to talk about was I, the more and more I keep thinking about our meeting on the 7th, um, first day of school, I would really love our administrators, I mean, Matt, to be here and be active. And, I mean, it's the first day of school. Um, can we, like, maybe, can I put out an email looking for other dates of availability and, can we look at maybe changing that? Would anyone be? Would anyone object to that? Not meeting on Tuesday the seventh, um, or meeting and just having like a board retreat or work session, as opposed to I want to work on our goals with the administrators, but I want to work on it a full evening, um, full length evening. And I know you guys are going to be here all day, and I know some people have new things they're starting as board members, and there's a lot of stuff going on that day. I'm just asking, do we want to consider doing anything about that or sticking with our original plan? That could be Don't. October. There's no rush on that. I mean, we could do it the next I'd month. like to have something sooner than that, Jan. Um, like, I, I mean, I'd like to try to find something. Yeah. Um, but I, anyone? Well, 
we also had something in theory coming on the 13th. Okay. So I would rather just postpone it to uh, October I mean. because I've got stuff going on. So yeah, well. That's why we stuck this on the 7th. Yeah, but did we stick it on the 7th? Like, was it stuck there, or did we have this planned? Well, it, it was scheduled for the 7th. Yeah. And now you're saying that you want to move it. I'm, I'm asking if we're interested in moving it. I personally can be here. Um, I'm just thinking of all the people involved. And in, what it is is our goal-setting evening. We're going to be here probably four-plus hours um, working on goal-setting and, and that. I mean, that's what it typically is. So I'm just trying to account for people that have dealing with their kids on the first day of school and whether it be administrators. So I'd like to look to find a different day to set our goals. I don't necessarily know that I'm interested in waiting till October to set our goals, but maybe we look at the 21st. Um, but again, we, we don't need to have the conversation tonight about when we're doing it. I'm just, I'm, I guess what I'm asking right now tonight is, is the seven still viable for our goal setting meeting or do we want to consider moving it? I'm I would like to feedback. consider moving it. I apologize? I would like to consider moving it. And it's I, the first day of school for my three children. It's going yes. to be crazy that and night. I, I can't dedicate four that's, hours here. Yeah, that's that's what I, the more yeah. I thought, I mean, I'm super like, oh, let's have a meeting. And then I'm thinking. Can, can I throw out a suggestion yeah, just please. for consideration? The 21st, there's already a meeting if you were to take a portion of time on the 21st. I don't know how hefty the agenda is necessarily going to be. But if you wanted to do it on the 21st, you could start the process or at least start the dialogue however long it takes, and then if you wanted to yeah. schedule the follow-up in October. I'm just, again, just a suggestion. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know what people are thinking. But. Yeah, like I said, I think we can solve the when. I'll pull up our availability, and I'll see what people want. We'll look at the board meeting. Well, we're already um, meeting on the 21st uh, for a regular board meeting. So correct. Yeah. We're just a week away from Tuesday, and, and yeah. I'm just, I mean, I know how I we start ready. hitting 7, 30, 8 o'clock, and, well, you know. Why don't we start, like we said we were going to start earlier, like at 5 o'clock, if, if anyone can make it, or six, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll put out an email, and, and yeah. I'll double check on the availability, and we'll go from there. Let's, but let's are, we, are we okay postponing the 7th? Um, Molly, feedback on that? Yeah, I can't fine. tell without the mask whether you're happy or sad. Yeah, that's good. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Do they, they, I think they make digital masks where the face shows up just, on them. Yeah, you just turn it. Um, that'd be kind of cool. Hey, you okay? I'm fine. And um, I'll... Uh, I'll take the chance that Jody and Diane are watching and they're not blowing up my phone. So <laughs> I'll think that they're in the segment. Okay, do I need to make a motion on that? Okay, so I'd like to make a motion to postpone TBA, um, the seventh meeting. Um, any uh, discussion on that? Or no, I'd like to make a motion. Have someone accept it? So I'll second it. Anyone second? I just, I'll oh, second it. You'll second it. Yes. Who first did it? Me? You did. Okay, I'll you first it, you second. Any kind of other conversation about it? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone against? Uh, nope. Good. Okay. Thank you. We're good. We'll figure that out. Anything else? Anyone else want to bring up? Nope. I appreciate it. Um, what, what's the official end of the meeting? I, Just I, adjourn? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll get adjourn. this right. I got 10 more months. <laughs> um, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Pete? Liz will second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. No one against? Thank you. Here. Thank you, everybody. I haven't heard that in a while.